name is Patty Maxwell, and um, I've been working as a developmental and behavioral therapist for Birth to Three Early Intervention Services now. For this summer, it'll be 16 years. I've also worked as a TSS and a behavior specialist for wraparound services. Uh, as a bachelor's level family-based mental health service um, provider and as an intensive case manager, which nowadays I think is just a regular case manager. They've gotten rid of that position as far as I know. And um, I am also the owner of a company called Engage Kids, where we do educational and behavioral services for kids of all abilities and all ages in homes, um, in the community, preschools, daycares, schools, wherever it is necessary. I have a master's degree in early or yeah early intervention for children with special needs from the University of Pittsburgh, and I have a second master's degree from Chatham University for infant mental health. I am a licensed behavior specialist, and um, I am also in the process of studying for my boards to become a board certified behavior analyst. So I also wanted to just throw out there that everything we're going to talk about today is very um, basic. It's kind of, um, it's all a little bit intense when you start talking about autism. So I just wanna kind of give everybody the main points. But again, if there's any questions or you want me to dive in a little bit deeper, I certainly will try to. So let's just start off with a really nice little clip that I think sums up autism quite well. When it comes to autism, Hi. finding the right words can be tough. Finding understanding doesn't have to be. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Julian, I love you. Together, we can create a kinder, more inclusive world for the millions of people on the autism spectrum. You. I love that clip. I think it just encompasses so many different aspects of autism. So just some facts that I wanted to share with everybody. Uh, in 2020, the CDC reported about one in 54 children in the U.S. are diagnosed with autism at this point. Boys are four times more likely to be diagnosed than girls. Researchers have found that genetics are involved in most cases, although they don't know everything about that quite yet. Uh, kids born to older parents are at a higher risk of autism. Families with a child on the spectrum have a 20% risk of another child with autism. And the average cost of a child with autism each year is about $60,000 through uh, childhood, which is astronomical. So now what? You think your child may have autism or you're unsure what's going on with your kiddo, but you know something is happening. Um, where do you go? Where do you start? Uh, this is truly the first step, actually acknowledging that something isn't right, something's going on with them. And uh, my daughter doesn't have autism, but she does have an auditory processing disorder and a visual processing disorder. And so I have been there. I have gone through the something's up, what's going on, what do we do, where do we go for help, um, what can we, you know, how do we get help? right this second, even though you know there's a million wait lists, uh, I have been there. So the best thing you can do is follow your parent intuition, your mama bear intuition, and look for more help. So the first step you really do is you have to uh, start off with your pediatrician and you can go to them and they'll do this. This is the test called the MCHAT, the Modified Checklist for Autism and Toddlers. Uh, again, depending on how old your kiddo is, but if you start suspecting things when they're kind of younger, then you can start off here, which is again with your uh, pediatrician. And then if that uh, testing tool looks like there's more going on there, they will identify that you need to have a thorough uh, developmental autism evaluation, and then you make an appointment with a developmental psychologist. And just like everything, especially right now during COVID, 
uh, appointments are very few and far between. If you do get yourself into an appointment and say it's three, six, nine months away, the best thing you can do is to put yourself on a cancellation list and hope for the best. Uh, I've had many, many families that'll get on the cancellation list and their wait is eight months. They get in in two or three months. So it just depends on your flexibility and um, what pops up with that. So back in 2013, uh, you would hear the, the terms autistic disorder, pervasive developmental disorder, which is PDD, or you would hear Asperger's syndrome. And that in 2013, that was changed. And now what we're hearing is autism spectrum disorder. And that is just the generic diagnosis that they give um, anyone who they are thinking that has autism. And depending on who you go to, what psychologist or what have you, you will get uh, different levels of it. They might say severe, moderate, you know, mild. They might give a number to the actual diagnosis. It just depends. But that is the diagnosis that um, you will see if your child is on the spectrum. So uh, this is a question that was proposed for today, and so I do want to address it. What if a parent suspects this diagnosis and is waiting for a diagnosis? What could they be doing while they wait? Um, so I'm guessing already that this family might have an appointment. I'm hoping that they have an appointment with a developmental psychologist or someone similar to that. Uh, this is a very upsetting piece of everything. Like I said, the waiting game. I mean, I've heard anywhere again from three months, if you're incredibly lucky, to anywhere up to a year, if not longer, from for some specific um, therapist or psychologist, doctors, specific people that you might want to get into. So uh, as I said, if you can get on to the second that you're feeling that there is an issue, a concern, if you can get onto a wait list somewhere, the better off you are. And then at that point, you know, if you have a six month wait um, and in six months you have no concerns, you cancel. It's not a big deal. But if you wait six months and then you're really, really concerned, now you have to wait a whole nother six months. So we're a year further than where we should be. So again, if there is any concern whatsoever, any sort of red flags, um, whether it's autism or something else going on, I mean, it could be a speech delay rather than autism, but definitely get yourself on a wait list somewhere. And again, if you don't need it, you cancel it, not a big deal. So as far as some things that you can do, while you wait, um, there are all kinds of services out there that don't require a specific diagnosis to get you started. So again, depending on the age of your child, we have birth to three early intervention services. There are three to five early intervention services. There's outpatient speech, outpatient occupational therapy or OT, outpatient physical therapy or PT. Uh, private pay services, and you'll see a lot of different ones uh, floating around with this. And this could also encompass things like um, music classes. This could be a gym class so that you get some of the energy out of your little one. This could be a swimming class. You know, these anything that will get your child engaged. Uh, anything that, you know, a swim class, typically if they're littler ones, you could go in and be part of that. That's not a problem. Uh, even increasing play dates, even if they're just family members, it doesn't matter. Getting your kiddo around other kids, getting them active, getting them engaged uh, are definitely some things that you can do while you are waiting for that diagnosis. And I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but the person that asked that question, if you have anything else that you wanted to throw in there, about that, please do. Uh, again, there's a gazillion different services out there. And like I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be one of the typical services that we always see, which is on the screen. It could be something more like a music class, therapeutic horseback riding, um, anything, anything like that, just as long as you're getting your kids engaged. So now we have the autism diagnosis. You've gotten it. You've waited all this time and you've driven yourself crazy the whole time while you're waiting for this diagnosis. And then you get the diagnosis and now what? Now you're completely crushed. Um, I went through this with my daughter. Like I said, it's not autism, but there was a there is a disability there. 
And I went through a major grieving process with it, even though I knew something was going on with her. I really thought that finally having an answer, finally getting some, all of my questions answered would make me feel a little bit better. But I think it took me a good year, maybe a little bit longer to stop um, myself from tearing up or from crying every time I would talk about it after that. Uh, there was the sense of loss, sense of grief, everything. And, um, you know, you're especially for kiddos that are diagnosed with autism, you walk out of the office with this giant packet of information. Half of it makes no sense whatsoever. And you're kind of put out there into the world and have at it. Good luck. Uh, it is not an easy situation. It is not easy to deal with. And I want to share, I don't know if anybody's familiar with, um, with this woman. This is Kate with Finding Cooper's Voice. This is a little bit lengthy. It's about 12 minutes, so please bear with me. Uh, but I think that she really does a great representation of kind of the stages of grief and what you go through when your child is diagnosed with any sort of a disability, but specifically with autism. So I hope you can maybe relate with this. Hey everyone, it's Kate to Finding Cooper's Voice. I hope everyone's having a great weekend. I'm gonna do my video today on regression and not regression in our children on the spectrum, but regression that parents go through in the grieving process. I think it's not very often talked about. Um, so this video will be a little bit serious as mine usually are, <laughs> unless we're looking for trains. And um, just a warning, I have Sawyer finger painting in front of me and Cooper running around like a maniac. So I'm gonna try and hammer this out because I think it's a really important topic. So there's five stages of grief. Um, everyone's heard of the five stages of grief. They're denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. And I think those equate very, very well to having a child with a lifelong disability. And in my disclaimers, I absolutely love my son. Um, he's amazing. He is on the spectrum. He's almost seven. He's on the severe side, which people sometimes get frustrated when I say that, but he is on the severe side. And his future is very much unknown. And I don't know I mean, I have an idea of what the future is going to be. I, I don't know if my son will ever talk. I know that he will live with us for the rest of his life. But I also thought he would never be potty trained. And I, the hardest thing I've ever done, I just potty trained an autistic seven-year-old. Sorry, those brushes won't work because they're dirty. Um, I did it, and it's... I think my greatest accomplishment. <laughs> Still got the bruises. Where are this? Um, so when you're, if you're new to the journey, um, for me anyways, I'll talk about how it was for me. I knew something was off with Cooper um, when he was two days old. I knew immediately in my gut that I was a new mom and I, and I, I didn't know. I mean, he didn't sleep more than 45 minutes at a time. He didn't sleep more than six to eight hours in a 24 hour period. He struggled to nurse. He struggled to be content. Every single thing was a struggle. And it just progressively got harder and harder as he got older. And nothing was wrong. And I was talking to my pediatrician and I was involved in the school district, but I don't know. I, mean, I heard the word autism, but when I Googled it and did my late night Google searches of autism and the MCHAT, whatever that quiz is, he didn't meet any of the markers. It was a very confusing um, and lonely time. And I, you know, the first stage, I was in denial. I was like, he's just speech delayed. He's just developmentally delayed. And even that was hard for me to say in the beginning, but it was way better than saying that he had autism. Once he was diagnosed, I believed it wasn't true. I'm like, this has to be wrong. He would do things or um, it seemed so typical. We would have moments of clarity and moments where if we were home and we didn't leave the house and we didn't stress him out at all and didn't try to feed him a different food, if we just stayed home, 
and isolated ourselves, I would think this is going to be fine. Um, maybe he's high functioning. Maybe he's not autistic at all. I just lived in this state of denial. I remember my aha moment where I knew that my son was on the spectrum. Um, he'd been diagnosed for at least a year and we went to the mall of America. It's a big mall in Minneapolis, Wilmington. And it literally happened on a carousel. Um, he couldn't wait in line and he just head hit it, um, beat his face, but he wanted to be on it so bad. And he screamed and cried. And I looked around and sweat was dripping off my face and tears were dripping down my face. And I realized my son was on his face. And then I got really angry. I was angry. I'm going to say some statements here that I don't want them to offend anyone, but I couldn't figure out what the hell I did wrong and why me. And I did everything right. And I was a good mom. And I didn't do drugs and drink when I was pregnant. I didn't. I followed every rule. Why me? I was so mad. Um, but yet so confused because you can't be mad at the kid or that's autistic. You love your kid. And their life is so hard. And your life is so hard. And you look around and your friends have typical kids and you see families doing things. And then you'll see families that have six children and they're all healthy and so many different things. Um, you'll wonder how drug addicts have healthy children. I mean, I could just, I could go on and on. Anger is a hard stage because no one wants to be angry. You don't want to live like that. And then you feel you're mad at yourself for being angry. You're mad at yourself for admitting that it's hard. It's a very confusing stage. Um, bargaining. Oh, did I bargain? I bargained late at night. Maybe after a few too many glasses of wine, I would say, I mean, crazy things. I know other parents have done this too. I'd be like, I'll take it. Give me, give me the disability and make him fine. Or I'd say, take my, take my arm, take, cut my hand off, make me blind, make me, I would just think these thoughts, like how could I make a bargain with God to fix Cooper? How do I, how do I do it? I bargained for a long time. I had a lot of late night conversations with God. I, it was hard. You know, the depressions peppered in, I think. Um, I never got too far on the depression scale. But oh gosh, I get sad. Um, even now, when I think that I'm, I'm in a really good spot, I still get really, really sad. And I, typically after, you know, a super public event or a super public meltdown or something really serious happens, um depression's tough there's a lot of stigmas around depression and you know we're caregivers our lives we're doing a million things all the time we're calling insurance companies and IEPs and no one's talking about the emotional side that parents go through there's a stigma we worry that if we're sad about the things that we're missing out on I mean I'm very open about that Today, I took my four-year-old to a parade and a fair with his friend. It was very fun. Cooper and I have never done anything like that. We've never really had a successful family outing. <laughs> Cooper doesn't enjoy doing things. These are all super honest, factual statements that are hard to say and make people uncomfortable. You know, the fifth stage is acceptance. And all these things can kind of happen all at one time. They're all tempered in together. Grief is not linear, my friends. You don't find out your child's diagnosed, get sad, and you're fine. Because you're, what you have to understand is autism is always changing. Wash your hands, please. Bring the chair up. Autism is always changing. So... You never know what's going to set you back. It might be for me, um, I could have a six-year-old that's the same age as Cooper walk up to me and have a conversation with me about 
zoos and fishing and talk to me and I'll realize I've never done that before. You know, the acceptance card is hard. So my, my purpose of this whole thing though is about regression. Because I want to tell you that you're going to have a lot of setbacks. So Cooper is just um, potty trained. I'm so proud of him. It was the hardest thing we've ever done. And after a super hard breakthrough like that, after something super amazing happens, I will regress and I will start over and I'll think, well, maybe he's really not that autistic. Maybe, maybe he's actually fine. Maybe he um, just had such bad tummy issues and constipation and maybe he couldn't hear and all this is going to be fine and I will start the whole cycle over again. It's crazy. I know that you have candy. I can see you. No candy. Yeah, you save it already. Put it in your bag. Um, you will start all over again in the grief cycle. At least I do. But what I've noticed, so here's what I've noticed. When I used to get angry or sad or depressed or confused about autism, when Cooper was younger, it would be long periods of time. Now I notice that my, my sad period, my, they're shorter. So it tells me it's getting better. But I've regressed a lot throughout the years. I'll think I'm fine. I will tell myself, it's okay if I never hear his voice because we'll use his talker. And it's okay if he lives up with us forever because I'll know he's safe. And you know, it's okay that he isn't gonna play and doing sports and we have other things. That, you know, I, I talk myself into it and I mean it, I'm fine, I'm okay. And then something will happen and boom, I'm back at the beginning. My message is, um, I don't always have the answers. I don't, I'm right doing this alongside of all you parents. My advice to newly diagnosed parents is, um, grieve it out. I hid my feelings for a lot of years because my family and friends and I was embarrassed and they weren't, they didn't know how serious autism was. They were great about it, but I was just really alone. So I cried my tears alone. I grieved alone. And I was super mom out in public. I was always fine. I was always doing great. Cooper was great. And then I, one day I waked up, woke up, and I started saying, you know, we're not doing that good. You know, Cooper's really struggling, or I'm having a really hard time because my son can't do family events. Yes, one second. No, no, no. Let's finish this. Can I say, how are you painting? That's a beautiful face. You look really good looking. You're painting. So go easy on yourself. Talk about autism. Talk about how you're sad. These are not negative statements. I want you to know that. Saying, I'm sad that my son will never talk does not mean you're a negative person. It means you're accepting reality and you're moving along. And it's okay. Um, say goodbye. Can you say goodbye? What did you go on riots today? I hope everyone has a fantastic night. I think you're biting me and that's really sweet. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. 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 Okay, so I apologize. I know that was a little bit lengthy, um, but I feel like her message is just really heartfelt and um, can reach a lot of people. And now I know, like she was saying, talk to people, you know, get involved, things of that nature. But I know even for myself, in the beginning, the last thing I wanted to do was talk to anybody about it. And um, like her, I said, her name is Kate, and it's Finding Cooper's Voice. She has a ton of different vlogs out there on YouTube, all the way from Coop, when Cooper was much younger until he's, in that video, he was seven. Uh, and they're all very different experiences. Uh, there's one when she is in a car, 
and it's right before she goes to work. She completely melts down, and that one actually went viral, and she was on the Today Show for it. Um, I don't think any of that was her intention in the beginning. I think this is just her therapeutic way of getting through all of this and trying to help others. So if you are a parent that does need some help, somebody um, to make you feel like you're not alone, and this is a way that you can watch things, you can feel like you're not alone, but you don't have to participate, clearly, because you're just watching videos. So that's a good suggestion that I'm gonna throw out there. Anyway, some of the do's and don'ts after an autism diagnosis. Don't let the autism diagnosis intimidate you. Do give yourself some time. And time is so important. You know, some people, as soon as they get the diagnosis, bam, they are out there, they are ready to like fight the world and get everything set up and ready to go. And some people need some time and that's okay. And whether you need a day or you need a month, it doesn't matter. There is no right or wrong here. You take as much time as you need to pull it together and to get things uh, going. Don't let the autism diagnosis cause you to feel sorry for yourself. Do count your blessings. A mm, little bit easier said than done, but eventually I feel that we get to that point. Don't let the autism diagnosis cause you to forget. Do you remember that sweet baby you fell in love with? You know, I've been with families uh, during the appointments for getting the child diagnosed with autism. And I always have to remind them right afterwards because you can see the distress and the disappointment and the sadness as we walk out of the office. And I'll remind them, you know, Joey is still Joey. He's still the same baby doll that he was 10 minutes ago before we walked into that appointment. He's still the same kid. You know, now we just have a name for what is going on with that child. Autism is, it's your child isn't autism. He's still your child. So try and keep that in the back of your head too. Don't let the autism diagnosis leave you feeling self-conscious or paranoid. Do understand there is no guilt to be had or blame to be placed. And again, whether you have your child diagnosed at 18 months, two and a half, or when they're 16, there is no blame there. Um, don't let the autism diagnosis isolate you. Do reach out for help. And again, where I brought up about watching Kate and some of the um, the videos for, for Cooper's voice, that is a way that you can still stay connected and feel that you're not alone if you're not ready to join a parent group or talk to other family members or people that you know. A few more, don't let the autism diagnosis rob your other children. Do explain autism to your children and what it means to your family. This is a biggie. I um, I have a lot of families that won't talk to the rest of their family members, but you know, there are, whether the children are older or younger, they know something is, is going on. They know something is different. Uh, they might not have a name for it and even naming it doesn't explain it. You need to explain it. There are so many wonderful children's books out there right now that explain autism. Um, in fact, there's one about a Frisbee. I think it's um, Andy's Yellow Frisbee, I think it's called. Uh, but there are, there are some wonderful books that can really help. I know a family that I work with, um, there's an older brother and he just didn't understand what was going on with the little brother. And um, we put into place a few of these books and it's amazing how his understanding just blossomed. And um, in fact, when the grandparents would yell at my little guy for doing something, the older brother would come into play and say, oh no, no, that's okay. He's allowed to be doing that. You know, he was then, he understood why and he understood it was part of the diagnosis and it became more real for him. So try that. Uh, don't let the autism diagnosis steal your joy. Do maintain a sense of humor. Again, this might be quicker for some, less for others. Uh, don't let the autism diagnosis squash your hope. Do be willing to dream a little differently. You know, none of us have a crystal ball and none of us who have a little one that's diagnosed at 18 months, we can't look at that crystal ball and say, you know, at 18, they are going to be this or they will not be this. We don't know. We are, we're just, it would be nice if we could. It would be perfect, a perfect world, but it just doesn't happen that way. Don't let the autism diagnosis cause you to doubt your faith. Do take advantage of things autism can teach you. And it's amazing what kiddos on the spectrum can teach you. 
I have learned some really cool things that I probably would never know about cars and trains and states and um, how they look at the world just a little bit differently. Uh, don't let the autism diagnosis pull you into frivolous debates. Do use your time and energy wisely. And I think that this goes back to somebody's personality also. You know, we all get those moments of standing on a soapbox for whatever reason. And um, I know a lot of families, a lot of friends of mine that do get on a soapbox when it comes to autism and they end up just diving deeper and deeper, kind of spiraling and it's not helpful for them. So you need to find that place and space that you are comfortable and that you can uh, continue to thrive so that you'll be healthy for your own kiddo. So now that we have the diagnosis, what are we gonna do? One biggie is you need to get yourself, or you need to get your child medical assistance. Uh, you also, this is again, if you're in um, Pennsylvania, if you're somewhere else, I'm not really sure what every other state has, but this is for Pennsylvania specifically. You need to get medical assistance and you need to get either an approval or a denial letter from SSI because the two of them go hand in hand. So uh, the medical assistance may say that you can't start filing that until you have the SSI denial, but that's actually not true. You can do them both simultaneously and um, this whole process can take anywhere. I mean, hopefully it's around a month. I'll be honest, since COVID, I don't know if it's gotten worse, but typically it's anywhere from like a month to two months. So this is one of the quicker things that you might run into, but it is something that you wanna do right away because a lot of the services out there are covered through medical assistance. And I don't care if you're the richest person or the poorest person, you know, money is still money and it still helps if you can save some money in different places and some of these services are only accepted they only accept medical assistance so you do want to jump on this like asap this is just a site if anybody wants to take a quick screenshot although this is being recorded like we said so um, that's a good site that i found that uh, kind of walks you through the whole medical assistance process uh, it is a process and I also just wanna throw out there, this is different than medical assistance because of financial reasons. Uh, there is a loophole in the medical assistance for children with special needs. Um, I am certainly not rich, we are middle class. Uh, my husband has all of our insurance and everything, but my daughter having her disability, she gets medical assistance and it is through the loophole. And um, it was awful to jump through all the hoops, getting it all started. And every year in around April, March, April time, which is always around tax season, which is a pain in the butt, but always around that time, I do have to fill out the paperwork again, which is minimal. It gets very minimal as you go through, um, but it's minimal, but I always have to put in there about our finances, even though it is not financially driven, it drives me crazy but that is something, again, this site will help you walk through it. So services covered under the medical assistance program, they can include some mental health wraparound services or ABA services. Now, um, it used to be that wraparound services were only covered through medical assistance and that ABA services, that's a tricky one. So I have heard both. I have heard that uh, medical assistance is now starting to cover some ABA services. I have heard that they're still not covering them. So I think that that is something that you're gonna to have to discover on your own. Uh, but I know that some ABA programs uh, do take your private insurance. And then some of the ABA programs are completely private and pay out of pocket. So that's something that you're gonna to have to kind of gauge and see which one would be better for you and for your kiddo. Uh, In-home personal care services, then this could be like, um, uh, let's see, like a respite kind of a situation. It could be if you need some nursing for your kiddo for whatever reason, if they have a trach or any kind of severe medical issues. The diapers. Now, this is something that a lot of people uh, don't know about or they forget about this. But after your kiddo turns three, if they're diagnosed with autism, you flip over 
the medical assistance card and you call the um, customer service line and you can actually get diapers delivered to your home. They will sit outside your door, no wipes, but diapers. They will be there at your house. I always tell families, say you go through four or five diapers a day, tell them 10, you always have extra that, that way in case you have some pretty ugly blowouts or something, you always have, always have more. But um, this is like one of the perks, I guess, to, um, to having the medical assistance is that again, if you, and, and it's different for everybody as well, depending on um, the type of medical assistance that you have, you might have to get a referral from your pediatrician. You might be able to handle it directly one-on-one -on -one, uh, through the insurance company, but it is a nice thing that you can do because diapers are pricey. And as your child gets a little bit older, Diapers get less in a package and more expensive. And also you can get pull-ups. So that's always nice for potty training. I mean, Kate just explained her son was seven by the time she got him potty trained. Seven years worth of diapers or pull-ups, that's a ton of money that you could be saving. Um, nutritional supplements prescribed by a physician. So you have to watch this. Again, they have to be prescribed by a physician that you can pick up at a pharmacist. Uh, a lot of families will go the route of kind of like an all natural approach, things of that nature with like a chiropractor. Those type of supplements will probably not be covered. And um, I threw in their chiropractic, you know, depending on which chiropractor you see, depends on if they take medical assistance or not as well. And I don't believe I put anything in here about chiropractics. Uh, prescriptions, if your kiddos have any kind of prescriptions, they can be covered in-home nursing, so that again goes along with the in-home personal care services, and um, physical therapy for PT, OT, these are all kind of the outpatient therapies, and then the speech therapy. So if you are going now for uh, speech therapy and you are paying with your private insurance and you're paying like a $25 deductible, once you get medical assistance, that deductible ends. Also, most private insurances will give you a cap. There's, you know, 10 sessions, 20 sessions, whatever it is. There are no caps when it comes to the medical assistance, as far as I know. 25, this is a pretty significant number. This is the average amount of time, hours, that are pres or suggested prescribed for kiddos diagnosed with autism. Now, again, this can be a little bit more, a little bit less, also depending on the child's age, if they're in full-time school, things of that nature but 25 hours a week. Now, that sounds like a ton, but if you break it down into seven days, it's only about three and a half hours a day, but this is structured therapy. So this could be occupational therapy, this could be physical therapy, speech therapy, developmental therapy, this could be a wraparound service, this could be um, preschool, if they're in a therapeutic preschool, this could be, uh, let's, uh, I said therapeutic horseback riding, music class. I look at it as anything that is a structured program for your kiddo on the spectrum can be clumped into this 25 hours. Now, if you're speaking to a possible board certified behavior analyst, a BCBA, who does the ABA program, they might say to you, no, all 25 hours need to be clumped into this. But my personal feeling is that you need to have the well-rounded piece to the child, not just doing sitting at a table doing uh, structured therapy for 25 hours. That's a lot on a kiddo. Uh, so that's just, again, that's my personal opinion, but 25 hours is the one that you'll hear the most. Again, you might hear 15, you might hear 40, but 25 is the average. When I started 20 some years ago, it was 40 hours, strict, low VOS, discrete trial, at a table, it was wicked but it's definitely come a long way from then. So again, possible service, early intervention, the zero to three and three to five. Case management is a nice one to get right away also. Uh, that person can help you decipher what kind of services are out there, if there's any funding that might be possible. Again, funding is very few and far between, but occasionally we might find it. Uh, if your kid is school-aged, getting them an IEP, uh, speech therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral therapy, which includes the wraparound or ABA services, physical therapy, developmental therapy, social skills groups, and psychiatric services and medication management. All different services that are important um, and that can be covered through, can or may be covered through medical assistance. So I know I just 
kind of dumped a ton of information on everybody. But another question that was thrown out there was, do I have to tell the school about my child's diagnosis? Um, there was a little bit more to the question too, but I didn't want to put all those details on here. The, the quick and easy, dirty answer to this question is no. Legally, you do not have to tell your child's school district, your child's teachers about their diagnosis. But let me also say that if you don't, what could they be missing? So along the lines of this question, there was also the statement that once the kids are diagnosed with autism in this school, it's kind of like they're pigeonholed and they kind of get dumped into the autist autistic support classroom. My guess, honestly, is that the teachers and the faculty, the staff, whatever, they already know that something is going on with your kiddo. So you have to weigh out what is going to be best for this child. Is it maybe getting yourself a school advocate and helping them through, helping you through the IEP process. Um, to just put a child in an autistic support classroom that doesn't need it isn't right. So you wanna have them in the least restrictive environment possible. And just prior to actually coming on with you guys, I sat in on two different IEPs, but the one specifically was for a friend of mine whose son is um, autistic and in middle school. And um, let's just say that the school has not been held accountable up to this point. Uh, I am now stepping in and I am going to make sure that the school is being a little bit more accountable, making sure that the school is implementing different things that they have on paper, but that they need to be doing in person. So I know everybody can't have that type of a service, but um, a getting a school advocate is definitely something that can be beneficial for you, especially during IEP meetings and um, and making sure that your kiddo is getting the right services and the right placement so that they are not put into a placement that is um, too easy for them or too difficult even for that matter. So I hope that answers that person's question. If not, please put something else in the chat and I will hopefully touch on it a little bit further for you. Another question or kind of a statement that was thrown out there was the problems that occur with trying to make our children too compliant. My son is terrified to even talk at school. Now, I have to tell you, when I read this, it really broke my heart because, and I, I don't know the age of this child, I don't know the situation or what's going on, but you know, I just picture any kiddo that is so afraid to talk in a classroom, afraid to ask for help. And so, this seems like an issue with the school or with the teacher, which again, a school advocate would be phenomenal for this. Uh, if you are getting any sort of outpatient, um, the wraparound services, your behavior specialist could go in there. If you have a private service, the, um, the therapist could go into the school trying to figure out what's going on here. Uh, because this is, this is not okay. Your child shouldn't be this compliant. On the flip side of that, and again, I'm playing devil's advocate, there does have to be structure in a classroom. There does have to be some sort of accountability and rules. And so, you know, is this child taking it um, to the extreme or is the teacher taking it to the extreme? I'm not sure. And I'm not gonna try and pretend like I know. But um, the fact that the child is scared to talk, that, that's not okay. So again, you know, in schools, like a type of Montessori program, uh, a cyber school program, if you're gonna homeschool the child, you can kind of do whatever you want. Uh, not to say that Montessori doesn't have some structure, they do, but the structure is a little bit less than in a, um, in like a public school setting. And even some of the smaller schools, some of the private schools, the Christian schools, things of that nature, you know, you run into some issues there too. They don't always have the funding for the services that your kiddo might need. So you really have to weigh out all of the possibilities and the struggles. And then, you know, I always say too, the squeaky wheel gets heard. So you can squeak at school without going to the jugular, without, you know, screaming and yelling and swearing. You know, you can say things like, hey, Joey, Bobby, whoever this might be, is coming home a little bit scared. Am I missing something? What's going on at school? What can we do at home? And hopefully that will open up a conversation and, um, and get things started. And if it doesn't, 
start doing the stepping stones. You know, if you can't get through with the teacher, then you go through the special ed teacher. If you can't get through there, go to the principal or vice principal. Can't get anything there, you start going to the special education director. And if you're still feeling like you're not getting anywhere, this is where an advocate can really be great to have in your back pocket. Um, so I hope that kind of sort of answered that question or statement. Uh, something that Christina and I were discussing right before we went on is, I don't know if everyone can see this, but I use these quite often, and it is a generic calendar. Just, I literally printed it out off of uh, Google, Google calendars, and I recommend these to families for several reasons. One, because you can keep track of behaviors very easily. So if you see that Joey is coming home every Wednesday with a uh, red, or every Wednesday he's having you know, several meltdowns at school. Well, what is happening on Tuesday? What's happening Tuesday night? What's happening Wednesday morning at school? They, you can really kind of decipher um, to figure out, you almost have to play like a detective, what is going on? And then like Christine and I were saying, you have proof. So don't just do a month and then throw it away. Keep this, file it with all of your important paperwork because if you're, child comes home and says that they didn't have speech therapy that day, jot it down. If they come home and had five meltdowns that day, jot it down. When you go in for the next meeting or IEP meeting or even just a conversation with a teacher or with you know higher ups, whatever it might be, you have proof. They might say, oh, that's not really happening. Whoa, I have five giant red dots in one week. That was a really rough week you can prove that it's happening. And you can't just make stuff up like that out of thin air in a matter of a couple of days if you have several months worth of um, data collection. So that's something to keep in mind too.